Good morning, everybody. Um, so as we go through this, I think that the, the real thing to keep in mind that is an important frame of reference goes back to something that Robert said earlier, um, which I think is, is, is crucial to really understanding how this data can work and also how this data can be um, protected from a privacy standpoint. And so with what Robert said at the beginning around volunteered versus observed data, I want to um, be careful to point out that what we're looking at with Twitter fell squarely in the category of volunteered data. We're looking at tweets that people have chosen to make public, and as a result, we are simply um, simply looking at those things that they have shared with, with people all over Twitter and, and broadcasting. Um, also tying into the theme of big data, uh, just to give a point of reference, at Crimson Hexagon, we are approaching with a bated breath storing our 100, one storing our 100 billionth uh, social media document that we expect to happen sometime in early 2012. So big data is, um, is approaching an understatement. To look at the project objectives that we like now, um, really we're driven by the question that I think Robert alluded to, can social media data give any insight into stress or instability that's happening within a population? To, um, to you may have, may have missed something here on this slide, so I'm going to fill in what I remembered was there. Um, so essentially, the, the answer, shockingly, is, is most certainly yes. I, I want to make sure that even though that's not on the slide, that's clear. Um, and the reason for this is, is because um, uh, with social media data, uh, we heard about blogs, forums, other social media sources earlier. Twitter falls into the same category. People are sharing what's happening in their day-to-day -day environment, and as a result, those, those um, social and development challenges, which, which are really kind of um, in your daily experience, are front of mind. So you don't have to ask a survey question about what's a source of tension. You get to see it because people in their daily experience will talk about what's, what's stressing them out, uh, whether it's a school exam or not being able to afford their rent. To give a brief overview of the technology, um, I, I want to I want to point out that there are several different technological approaches that are that are um, on the market and thriving in social media analysis. Um, it's it's really I think a situation where different approaches are better and worse for different situations, but I think we're all working um, in some ways to make each other's technologies better. So I was very very happy to hear um, some of the some of the insights that were brought by my colleagues from SAS. Um, I think there are a lot of a lot of approaches in the space that um, that make sense for different circumstances. Um, our technology was developed um, out of Harvard University at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. Um, and going back to something that Issa said, um, it's it's really a sort of everything old is new again kind of situation. Um, the the technology that <coughs> excuse me that powers Crimson Hexagon was actually developed as part of a social science experiment several years ago where our founder, Gary King, looked at, um, looked at autopsy reports that were filed in hospitals and then went out to less developed communities and um, collected what he called verbal autopsies from people that were um, telling their experiences about caring for loved ones near death and compared those results. So our algorithm to this day is still something that we internally call VA, which stands for verbal autopsy. <laughs> um, so to give a bit of an overview about how our technology works, we take a statistical approach to understanding conversation at an aggregate and thematic level. Um, for international development challenge challenges, this, this, this allows us to do one very unique thing, which is um, understand language um, so long as the analyst using the system can read that language. In this particular project, we looked at conversation in English as well as conversation in a combination of Javanese and Bahasa Indonesia. Um, out of out of Indonesia, um, so so one 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 thing that that's a little bit unique about the approach that we take is um, is that that ability to to understand language kind of on the fly, if you will. <laughs> the way that this works is first you need a hypothesis for your for your analysis, um, and in this particular case, our hypothesis was um, just to take an example that that. Um, that we could, we could get a sense of, of people's stress about paying for, let's say, gasoline by looking at um, their tweets about, gas, um, about gasoline or, or fuel. Um, the second step is to choose content sources for your analysis. In this particular case, as I mentioned, we, we focus specifically on Twitter. Um, and then the third step is really um, 
I, I think something that, that is, is core to how our technology works and, and how you are able to use the results on the, uh, on the flip side, and that is to train our algorithm to understand the conversation based on the frame of reference that you're interested in. So in the case of, of gas and looking at what people are saying about, about um, every time they use the word gas or gasoline when they're tweeting in English, um, obviously you're going to get a lot of, uh, perhaps a lot of references to eating Mexican food. Um, and those are not really relevant to the conversation at, at, at this point. And so we train our algorithm to recognize that that's not relevant um, and that what you're interested in is perhaps people talking about not being able to afford filling up their tanks or talking about how much more expensive it was than two, two or three months ago. Um, and then based on this training set, our algorithm, um, our algorithm is able to, um, to measure how much of the conversation falls into each of the categories that the analyst is trained to recognize. So just to give a, sum, a summation of what I mean by that categorization process, this is an example of what we looked at in the United States related to uh, people's conversation on Twitter about gasoline and fuel. Um, we captured uh, what, I would, what, I would ca what I would classify, if you sort of look at the difference between sort of the third row and the fourth row, we captured both sort of what I would call factual conversation as well as more sort of opinionated or consumer driven conversation. Because uh, shockingly, there are people who will sort of live tweet their entire life, and uh, you get a lot of tweets that sometimes people just say, I'm at the gas station putting gas in my car, or, or even, I drove by a gas station. Um, and those things are fascinating, I, I, you know, but uh, per, perhaps not, not so relevant to policy in some cases. Um, although I think there are examples later on of how um, more kind of banal examples like that actually do become relevant. Um, but in this case, we looked at we looked at we we looked at the categories that they're listed on the screen, um, and one additional thing I'll point out: if you look at um, people people saying that they've purchased gas or that they've filled up their tank, um, that's something that um, I think reflects a good deal of the nuance that we're able to capture because you you want to reflect what what people are actually saying. So so if someone's saying that they've purchased gas without making a statement about whether or not they could afford it. You still want to capture how much how much people are talking about that because we may later on find out that those kinds of themes in conversation, even though affordability isn't explicitly mentioned, is, is actually a um, a relevant a relevant um, a relevant component to analyze. So looking at looking at people talking about their ability to pay their bills, and if you look on the bottom, we're we're not only we're not only looking at sort of the presence or absence of the word afford, but we're looking at um, people talking about the level of debt that they're experiencing, as well as um, whether or not they can afford specific items. Using the process that I outlined, we're able to then track and, um, and ultimately um, begin to, to look from a predictive standpoint uh, when we compare it to other statistics, how much conversation is happening in different categories that are that are relevant. So what we see here is an example uh, from the conversation in Indonesia of people saying that they have um, the bait that their access to power is diminished. So um, so in this particular case they're reporting power out uh, reporting power out outages or reporting that um, they don't have fuel. Um, the analyst that we worked with um, in this particular project had a variety of uh, very, very sort of on the ground experiences of Indonesia. And she related to us several stories about um, certain weekends before holidays. Um, the lines around the gas station getting quite long just because um, everyone wanted to make sure they had enough gas to get where they were going and come home. And we saw several, several instances where conversation would spike um, and it, it wouldn't really correspond to any data that we had uh, about about widespread power outages in Indonesia, but then when we would look at the actual conversation, we would find that there were several complaints from, um, from specific areas or um, uh, specific parts of the country where, where there was vast, you know, uh, where there were long lines uh, in any case. Uh, this is an example from conversation in the United States, and I'm not sure that you can read, it might be too small to read the timeline across the bottom. This is looking at uh, people uh, in the United States tweeting about um, whether or not they feel like they can afford their housing. Um, this, is, this is that example that I meant about sometimes the sort of duh, average kinds of things of life become really interesting when you find that you're able to quantify them. 
So in this particular case, you'll notice that there are several spikes as you look across the conversation. Those correspond, um, probably not shockingly, to the first of the month when um, people having to pay their rent or their mortgage is front of mind, and uh, all of a sudden they're 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 sort of uh, you know broadcasting to the world through Twitter that uh, they they can't quite afford it. Um, lastly, in addition to those shift in, shifts in volume that we looked at. Um, there were instances where volume of conversation would remain relatively steady, but the, um, the tonality, or the, from a proportional standpoint, um, the, the, the proportional distribution of those things in conversation would shift. This is, again, an example from the analysis we looked at in people talking about affording their debts in Indonesia. And the yellow is um, people talking about their, their ability to afford new loans um, based on informal lending structures. And the pink is uh, based on formal lending structures, so the, the, the difference between a, a bank or uh, a village uh, money lender, for example. And what we see is that over time, especially into um, late uh, summer 2011, there's actually a shift in people talking about um, getting their debts from uh, informal channels versus formal, perhaps indicating that some of those formal channels may have been exhausted. Uh, the last example is actually um, literally looking at the price of rice. Um, and I think that, that this is a good example to end on because it illustrates the fact that um, as events happen, um, volume, simple volumes of conversation on Twitter can also be interesting. So this is looking at the price of rice compared to food infl inflation in Indonesia. Um, to, to kind of, whoop, not go, no, don't touch that button. Um, to, to recap, um, I think that the main conclusion that we had is that um, social media findings and their, their potential value to this kind of work is not limited to data in English, it's not limited to data in the United States, and even in countries that, um, that may not strike you as being at the forefront of what's happening in social media, um, there's rich conversation to be analyzed that offers um, a great potential for further analysis.